Thank you very much, Martin, and thanks to everybody for coming back. Today, we're giving a second lecture on the introduction to tropical curve counting. Uh, today's lecture is going to be divided in two parts, like on Monday. Um, the first part is going to be maybe a little bit more boring, I'm afraid, because we'll need to introduce a bunch of notation and background about um, convex discrete geometry that will be needed to make sense of the tropical enumeration that we'll introduce in the second part. And then in the second part, we'll actually talk about our main curve counting problem and the solution to the problem, right? Um, I'm gonna try to move a little bit faster to the fir first part, just to have a little bit more time to spend on the second. But please, if you're losing me, do not hesitate to interrupt me or ask questions. I'd be very much happy to slow down if needed. Okay, so then without further ado, you know, the first set of heroes uh, in our lecture are rational polyhedral cones, right? So rational polyhedral cones, um, the way I would like to introduce them is start with a finite set of uh, integral vectors in a vector space, right? So for example, here we go, here's one, and here's another, maybe this is the vector one, three, and then consider the non-negative linear span of these vectors, right? which means all the possible non-negative linear combinations, whoops, of these two vectors, and that gives you a cone, right? Uh, a cone is strictly convex if it's pointy, right? And formally that means if it does not contain a vector and it's negative unless this vector is the zero vector. And if we have a strictly convex cone, like the one I, I just drew, which is pointy, right? Then there is always a, min a unique minimal set of primitive vector gener generating sigma, right? So for example, in my example here, I could as well have thrown in this vector as well, and this vector, and taken non-negative linear combination of these four vectors, but in a sense, these two I drew in the middle are kind of not needed, right? And the half lines that are spanned by this minimal set of generators are called rays of the cone, right? Great, so let me go on page two. Now, after we introduce cones, we introduce fans. A rational polyhedral fan is a collection of cones, right? But with the property that any two cones should intersect in a phase, right? So for example, here I have two cones. This is cone number one. This is cone number two, delimited by the red rays, right? And my fan is given by the, the union of the two cones. A maximal cone is the um, of a fan is a cone which is not the face of another cone of sigma. So for example, in this example, I have two maximal dimensional cones. If I were to add another ray in here, say, here we go. Here we have another ray, but I don't fill in the two-dimensional part here, then this ray here is a cone, but it's not maximal dimension. And of course, we're gonna call a fan pure dimensional if all the maximal cones, sorry, I just, I stand corrected. This is still a maximal cone, it's the dimension one, but it's not true that all maximal cones have the same dimension. And so I would not call this a, um, uh, a pure dimensional fan, okay? so. So let me get rid of this Spears ray. And now I'm gonna define a weight function on a fan simply as assignment of a weight or an integer or a non-negative integer weight to each maximal cones of my uh, fan. So in this case, this is a choice of two integers, right? So I could, for example, say that to the cone number one, I assign the weight zero and to cone number two, I assign the weight 27, why not? And now the last you know, quick notation that I need to introduce in this uh, very quick introduction is the notion of a normal vector to a face inside a cone. So let me refresh here and um, draw a new picture. 
So suppose we have a maximal dimensional cone, sigma, there we go, sigma, and I look at a codimension one phase of this cone. So here we go, this is my tau. Then what I want to do, I want to look at the integral lattice of the vector space that sigma lives in. And I want to pick a vector in sigma that descends to a generator of the lattice of the quotient space of my vectors of vector space mod the span, the linear span of time. So in particular, I can choose in this picture, get one more color, any one of the vectors that connects the origin to one of these dots. So notice that normal vectors to tau in sigma, they're not unique in Rn, right? But they become unique. They all descend to the same vector in Rn. Or we say maps to the generator of lattice in Rn mod the image of time. Okay, so this is a lot of terminology, but we, we need all of this to give a notion of balancing for these fans. It's gonna be a notion that generalizes the notion of balancing of tropical curves. So let me jump to the next slide. So we're gonna define a pure dimensional rational polyhedral fan with a weight function to be balanced if for every codimension one phase tau of sigma, we have that the sum of the normal vectors to tau in sigma, as we vary over all top dimensional cones of which tau is a phase, weighted by the weight function is zero, but not in Rn, but in Rn mod the linear span of tau. So, Here's my picture to try to illustrate this, right? So I have a um, three two-dimensional cones, maybe in R3 or in some higher dimensional Rn, and I have a codimension one cone tau, denoted in purple. And each of these uh, this dimension two cones has a weight, right? There's a weight for sigma one, weight for sigma two, weight for sigma three. In red, I have denoted a choice of a normal vector to sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, um, sorry, to tau in sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. And in orange, I've denoted the, their weighted sum, the sum of omega sigma one times the vector correspond normal to sigma, to tau in sigma one, plus, 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 right? And this orange vector lives in the span of tau. Here on the right hand side, I have the vector um, vector space Rn mod the linear span of tau. So I have, you know, compressed to a point this purple uh, linear space. And in red, I have my three primitive no normal vectors. And I'm now asserting that the weighted sum of these three vectors uh, is equal to zero on the nose in this vector space. So just to check and make sure that we're all on the same page, um, let's take 30 seconds and why don't you tell me on the chat possible choices of weights for sigma one, sigma two, sigma three that make this statement true given how I have drawn the vectors in the um, quotient lattice here, right? So one vector here is the vector zero one, the other one is the vector minus two one, the other vector is the vector minus one. Let me see if I can pop out the chat and see.
Okay, great. I see that most people are with me. So there is, of course, uh, as Vance is pointing out, there's a, there's a trivial choice of weighting where can, we can make all the weights zero and then everything is gonna be balanced, but that's maybe a little less um, exciting. But otherwise, a choice that we can make that will make this fan balanced is give weight um, two to this cone, one to this cone, and one to this cone, right? Because if you add these two vectors, you get the vectors minus two, two, which if you add it to twice this vector, gives you zero. Okay, great. So I, I see that there's not a lot of question. I hope that means that everybody is happy as opposed to I'm going way too fast to even form a question. Um, so let's, let's keep going, right? In mathematics, you first introduce objects, then you introduce functions, right? That's always what we do. So what is a map of fans? Well, let's start with a fan in, in, in a vector space R to the M, another fan, sigma two in a vector space R to the N, and a map from the support of sigma one to the support of sigma two, which is just the, the physical locus of these cones, right? It's gonna be a map of fans if it is induced from an integral linear map of the ambient vector spaces, okay? So this requirement, this definition, sorry, does not require the, a map of fans to map cones to cones precisely, right? But it has to map cones inside cones. And we can always obtain that, you know, you can always make that a map uh, of fans sends cones to cones if we are willing to refine the cones, so to add some faces to either sigma one or sigma two or both, okay? So without loss of generality, we'll just be lazy and assume that when we say we have a map of fans, we'll have cones being mapped to cones, okay? Great. A question, um, is the map not all linear? So the map is gonna be R linear as well, right? But uh, sorry, the, 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 when I said Z linear, what I really meant is I, I want the map, which is, um, it's, it's integral in the sense, if you write it in a, in a matrix, the matrix has integer coefficients. And so you want, we want a map to preserve um, the lattice, the lattice, the integral lattice of our M. Okay, so given a map, of balanced fans of the same dimension, we're gonna define the notion of multiplicity of this map F at a point P. Okay, so here's some, um, some ugly looking formula, but maybe let's slowly unpack it, all right? So first of all, um, we're gonna take a point P that belongs to some maximal cone sigma, Right? And this is gonna be sent, F is gonna send this to some other cone, F of sigma. And this is F of P. Okay, so this cone comes with its weight weight of sigma. And this cone also comes with its weight, weight sigma two of sigma, of sorry, of f of sigma, right? So certainly we'll want to, to use these weights, right? And it makes sense that we would multiply by the weight on the source cone and we would divide by the weight on the target cone. This is absolutely a natural thing to do. But then the more interesting part is we take the index of a sublattice in some lattice. And what do we have? So here we have the ambient lattice restricted 
to the cone f of sigma. Or if you want, the linear space generated by f of sigma. So this is what I consider the, you know, the subambient lattice, right? And inside here, I have the image. So I have an integral lattice here. And because my map F is integral linear, F of this integral lattice is a sublattice of this lattice here, right? And so I want to take the, the index of the sublattice in this lattice, right? So this, you know, counts as one of those definitions in mathematics that are, you know, really ugly to look at at first, but then it's like, once you know what the ingredients are, what else could it be, right? But observe that in a sense, this is um, a generalization of the definition of intersection multiplicities of tropical curves that we introduced on Monday. So, Renzo, why is it yeah. natural to multiply by the domain and divide by the codomain? Okay, so, you know, the way that I think of these weights, right, is really a multiplicity of this cone, right? So, if I say that I give this cone weight two, I'm secretly thinking that I have two cones smooshed together, right? And so, if you send two cones over, right, they quote unquote cover the image twice as much as if they were, um, if you were sending over just one cone, right? On the other hand, if I, you know, if I put a three here, right, then I'm secretly thinking that I'm smooshing together three cones there. And so if I send over just one cone, I'm only covering one third of that smooshed cone, right? So that's why, um, I think it's natural to multiply by the weight of the source and divide by the weight of the image. Okay. Also, um, uh, someone thinks there's an extra parenthesis in the denominator. Is that correct? There is an extra parenthesis that they yeah. are correct. This should be erased. Okay. Thank you. And All right. And yeah. is it obvious that the multiplicity is an integer? Is it obvious the multiplicity is an integer? Um, it is not obvious and it's not, it does not have to be an integer, it just has to be a rational number in case I define, you know, um, just, you know, the multiplicity of a map of weighted fans, right? So for example, I could take the identity function, right, from a fan to itself, but then I could decide on the target to give that fan uh, very high integer weights for the cones, right? And then my multiplicity would be rational. Yeah, very good. Um, great, so once we have the multiplicity at a point, right? Then we can, degree, we can define the degree of a map. And this is, you know, you take a point in the target in the image, you look at all its inverse images, and you add up the multiplicity of the function at all the inverse images. Right? And this notion of degree, in order to be well defined, just like in algebraic geometry, we'll need some condition on target space, um, which the fan is irreducible. Um, irreducible, you know, you'll see more in detail in the problem session tomorrow, but it just means that you cannot see decompose the fan as the disjoint union of balanced fans with different supports. Uh, okay, and so under some reasonable assumptions on our target fan, given a map of balance weighted fans, we have a notion of degree, which is well defined. So it's independent of which point in the target you take. Uh, and again, this will be an exercise for you to do tomorrow in the problem session. So uh, someone is asking, is the parenthesis to be erased the other one? Is the parenthesis to be erased the other one? Uh, no, 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 it's this one, right? Because what you want to do, oh, no, sorry, you're, uh, let's see, is Z to the M? Yeah, totally right. The parenthesis to be erased is the other one. Thank you. All right. And do you also require the pre-image of Q to be in the interior of a maximal cone? Um, so, yes, 
we're gonna we're gonna make so there's a generosity the generosity assumption we we want q to be an interior maximal cone it's inverse image it's, it's inverse images right um well you know because of the requirement that we have made that we can subdivide um fans such that cones map to cones the inverse the inverse images are automatic and gonna be in um in the interior of maximal cones. Again, this is not true on the nose uh, if you don't make this further assumption that you're gonna refine um, your, uh, you're gonna subdivide your fans so that the, co the map uh, maps cones to cones. And if, if that's the case, then you, you make some generosity assumption. Take Q in the interior such that all inverse images are in the interior. And this is because we only have the weight functions defined in the interior of maximal cones, if you want. There's two more questions, actually. Okay. Yeah, can you give an example of a reducible fan? Um, yes, let me draw a raise here and get a pen instead of an eraser here. A pen. So here's your first example of a reducible fan, right? Because this is equal to this union this. And now the fan are just the union of four rays. There's no two dimensional cones. And, and in problem one. sessions, you, you will see an example. You will have to figure out an example of fans that is reducible and it cannot be, and it can be decomposed in more than one way. Yeah. And what's the other question? Uh, is it obvious that the degree of F is the same for all Q? It is not, but that is an exercise that um, is, is in the problem session tomorrow. It's kind of a, it's a good exercise. It's not. It's not. It's not a difficult proof, but it you know you have to dig into the definition of what it means, uh, of of a characterization of what it means to be reducible, and I don't want to spend the time right now on that. Yeah. Yeah, and a follow up on that also uh, is this only true if the uh, if the map is balanced? So the so. This is only true if the fans are balanced. Ah, okay, but the map. Okay. We haven't defined the notion. We, we don't have a balanced map, but we're talking about balanced fans. Yes. Okay. I hope I have addressed all the questions. Thanks for asking them. That's that's great. Um, on to the next definition we're going to define the notion of a marking and now we're going to take a you know rational polyhedral simplicial fan right this means that all you know all cones um well are simplicial cones in other words they have as many rays as their dimension right and a marking is just the choice of an integral vector not necessarily a primitive vector on each ray of the fan, right? Another way to think about it is that for each cone, I'm choosing uh, an R basis for the linear span of that cone among the integ integer um, integral vectors uh, of the rays of the fan. Right? And when we have a, a fan with a marking, we call it a marked fan. So here is, again, is an example of a fan with three two-dimensional cones. Each two-dimensional cone has two rays. And each ray, in each ray, I've now chosen a red vector, which is uh, integral, but not necessarily primitive. So why do we care about introducing this notion of markings? Well, there, it's a tool. It's a tool to both define weight functions. Once we have a marked fan, we automatically get an induced weight function. And we'll see that it's also going to be a tool to you know, have an easy way to compute a map of um, the degree of a map of fans. So let me jump to the next slide. Before you jump, the ray is yeah. supposed to be one dimensional. The rays are one dimensional. Yeah. So the, one, one way to think about the rays, the rays are the one dimensional cones of the fan. Great. So let's see what the what the fan 
Also, oh, what a market does. Where do fans live is another question. Sorry, can you repeat? Where do fans live? So fans right now, they all, they're all living in some ambient vector space R to the N, right? It's not just a vector space. It's a vector space with a lattice, right? I say R to the N because I need to know what the integral lattice Z to the N is inside. And that's what gives us a notion of what it means to be integral and what it means to be primitive. All right, so if we have a marking, we get an induced weight function, right? So let's take a cone sigma with rho one, rho k rays, and v1 and vk are the corresponding vectors in the marking. The induced weight function will give weight to the cone sigma equal to the index of the lattice. Well, what is the ambient lattice? Is the lattice um, the intersection of the ambient integral lattice with the linear subspace spanned by the cone? And then the sublattice is the lattice generated by the vectors of the marking. Okay? So, Again, for example, if I take my cone to be a, a non-negative, you know, totally positive orthant in some Rn, right? And V1 to Vn are just some integral vectors on the various axes of this orthant, right? Then this weight is just the determinant of the, the matrix obtained by putting these vectors in a matrix as column vectors, right? So that's, it's a pretty simple way to compute a weight. If we have a marking, we also have an easy way to check balancing. So if we have a marking and we consider the fan with induced weight function, then you can prove, and again, it's an exercise tomorrow in the problem session, that the fan is balanced if and only if the sum is in tau. So let's, let's think a little bit. Let me draw a picture also to slow myself down a second. Um, so suppose that we have a co-dimension one phase tau and a few cones sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. So because tau is co-dimension one, there is exactly one ray in each of the sigmas that does not belong to tau, right? So this is the ray that I'm denoting sigma one minus tau, and here's my vector of the marking V sigma one minus tau. I'm gonna have, this is the ray right here, that belongs to sigma two, but does not belong to tau. And so the vector of the marking, v sigma two minus tau is this one. And similarly, let me get my v sigma three minus tau. And now to check balancing, all I have to do is just take the sum of these vectors and make sure that this sum lives in the linear span of tau. So once we have a marking, if we want to know that a weighted fan, fan is balanced, we don't even have to compute the weights, right? We know that we can just compute whether a fan is balanced but just by looking at the vectors of marking, right? Which if you really care about a fan being balanced and not their weights, that's a big simplification. And the final, So is this condition, uh, is it true that this condition has to hold for all tau, the one on the previous slide? Yes, yes, right? So this, sorry, this is, um, yeah. So what I should have been a little bit more precise in this slide, I should have said, sigma is balanced at a, at a co-dimension one phase tau, it can only if this holds, right? And then it's balanced if for every co-dimension one phase tau, uh, it's balanced at tau, that's correct. And finally, and this is gonna be a big deal in the second half of our lecture today, if I have two balanced marked fans with induced weight functions, and 
let's take a cone sigma one in the source, sigma p, let's call sigma q the image of this cone, sigma p has a marking v1 to vn, sigma q has a marking, marking w1 to wn, I want to compute the multiplicity at p of the function f, and I, I can compute it as the, term, as the determinant of a matrix. Which matrix? Well, simply the matrix that represents the linear function f in the basis given by the markings, right? V1, Vn, because my cone is simplicial, is a basis for the um, subspace generated by sigma p. W1, Wn is a basis for the subspace generated by W. And so picking these two bases, I get a matrix with integer coefficients that computes, um, whose determinant computes the multiplicity of that. Okay, so big breath. We, this is the end of the first part of the lecture. Um, we're gonna break for 25 minutes. Uh, so we will start again the lecture at the hour. Um, thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks everybody for coming back or being part of the problem session. I've uh, walked around the rooms and saw that most people um, had a um, good idea of how to tackle the problems, which is great. Um, let me just address, I saw a question in the chat by uh, Xavier uh, that asked, what is the degree of the map of fans that maps M0 and TROP inside Q that we talked about last time? Uh, so in that case, you know, when we say M0 and TROP, and we have not mapped into Q. This is not yet a fan. It's just a cone complex, right? Because it does not live in an ambient vector space. So that map, that embedding, right, is what allows, to, allows us to consider M0 and TROP a fan, right? So in a sense, we cannot talk about what's the degree of that map because the source is not a fan yet. So it's a map from a cone complex to, uh, into a vector space and the image is a fan, and so then we give a fan structure to the source by, by identifying that it's an image. Thanks for the question. All right, now we're gonna uh, abandon just you know, cones and lattices for their own sake, and we'll actually talk about tropical stable maps. Okay, so here's some um, ingredients, and let me, oops, clean this. Um, a tropical, rational, and mark stable map to the plane is something that looks like this, right? So what do we have? So we have a tropical curve, an abstract tropical, an abstract tropical curve, right? So no embedding, just a graph with some length of edges and with edges of two colors, right? We have some red edges, sorry, red ends, and some black ends. And then we have a map that puts this tropical curve in the plane so that it actually looks like an embedded tropical curve. And look what happened to the red points, sorry, to the red ends, they all got contracted as motion out to points. Okay. So this is what you should keep in mind as I you know, now produce the next slide, which is way too verbose for being enlightening. So actually, let me see if I can put them side by side. Close this for a second. Okay, and so a tropical, rational, n marked stable map to R2 consists of a tuple gamma phi, right? Where gamma is an abstract, stable, tropical, rational curve with n black ends and m red ends, and I need, you know, at least two red ends, and I have no condition on the black ends. And a map phi from gamma to R2, it's a continuous map that restricts to an integral affine linear function on each edge or end of the tropical curve gamma, which means that if I take t to be a arc length parameter for the end, then phi of t is gonna be written as v times t plus a, where a is a point in R2, and v is a vector in Z2. v is called the direction vector of the edge or end. So for example, the end eight, 
right, is sent with direction vector 1, 1. And then we require balancing, right, that the sum of the direction vectors at each vertex is equal to 0. Um, we're not requiring the direction vectors to be primitive, right? So for example, the direction vector of the n marked 7 in this picture is not 0 minus 1, but is 0 minus 2, because that's what's going to make the balancing work. And we've re I mean, recorded this in this picture just by putting a blue 2 here, which is kind of reminiscent of the weight of that edge in the embedded tropical curve. Uh, and then we're going to ask, like I said, the red edges, and sorry, I, I switched M and N, right? So I apologize. So the red ends should have direction. You know, I switched the colors, the statement is still right, and I switched the M and N. Um, so the red ends should have direction vector zero, and the, the black ends should have direction vectors different from zero. Apology, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix this time later. Okay, so let me go back to just one slide at a time. And once we have tropical stable maps, we can put them into moduli spaces, right? Which can, we can consider the space of all possible tropical stable maps to the plane of a given degree. And what is the degree of a map? is given by the ordered list of the non-zero direction vectors of the ends. Okay? And if the degree consists of d copies of minus e1, so going horizontally to infinity to the left, d copies of minus e2, i.e. having ends that go vertically to minus infinity, and d copies of the vector e1 plus e2, so d ends that go to infinity in direction, diagonally, you know, direction northeast, then we say that the map is a map to, tro to, to tropical P2 and it has degree D. And we denote the moduli space of tropical stable maps as M0 and trop to P2 of degree D. Okay, an important fact that, um, again, you will see as an exercise in the problem session tomorrow, is that there is a bijection between the space of tropical stable maps of degree D to P2 and uh, M0N plus 3D trop times R2. So let me just spend one minute to make this a little bit more intuitive. So what this is saying is that suppose that I give you a abstract tropical curve with some black ends and some red ends. And then I assign the direction vector of the black ends to be non-zero. And I do know the direction vector of the red end should be zero. Then I don't have a lot of freedom on how I can put this datum in the plane if I want to satisfy all the conditions that mod tropical stable maps ask me to, right? Because for example, this end right here needs to go off to infinity horizontally. And at some point, I'm gonna have my red end which is contracted to a point. And then by balancing the direction vector associated to this end needs to continue being needs to continue to be horizontal. And at some point I reach the vertex, and then I know that this end should be mapped in direction minus E2. and this third end goes in direction E1 plus E2. Right, so there's only one thing in which I've been sort of sloppy, which is, you know, I don't know where should I stop here and at what height should I stop. In other words, you know, this picture, I can translate it anywhere I want in R2, and that could still be a good map, right? So 
I can fix the map just by fixing what the image of, for example, the red end is, right? Now, if I say, well, I want the red end to end up at the point, you know, one, two, then I have a unique map. Okay, so this is in essence saying that knowing a tropical stable map, right, is the same as knowing a starting point and then a abstract tropical curve with the datum of specifying the direction vectors of the ends of the black ends. Then the balancing condition will actually like produce the whole map. So what is the, the big, the upshot here is that if moduli space of rational tropical stable map is essentially tropical stable curves times R2, and we've made tropical stable curves into a balanced fan with all cones with weight one, well then the fact that we take a product with R2 does not make such a big difference. We can easily give the moduli space of tropical stable map the structure of balanced fan all cones with weight one. If you want the cones to be strict, we'll need to subdivide R2, for example, in the four orthons, but that's not such a big deal, okay? So these moduli space of tropical stable maps, which seemed a lot more complicated than what we've talked about on Monday is actually only a little bit more complicated. There's not much more there, okay? Great, but this space um, comes with what are called tautological morphisms, right? So for all the red ends, we have what are called uh, evaluation morphisms. And what does it do? Well, let me again draw a little picture. If I, if I have my tropical stable map, mapping into the plane as a tropical line, and this point, the red point is here. So remember, this whole picture, this whole picture right here, is a point in M0 and trop R2, or let me say P2, 1 in this case, and this N is 1. Right? And so this point, I'm going to map it to R2 via what I'm called, called evaluation 1 morphism. This is this red point by just looking at the coordinates of this point. Right, so this whole complicated datum of a map identifies the point in R2 with coordinates x, p, y, p. And I can play this game with each of the red marked ends because the red marked ends all get contracted to just a single point. Great, now the source morphism says, okay, if I have this complicated data on map, forget about the map and just look at the oops, source curve. So this abstract tropical curve without the map, without the plane, is the image of the source morphism. And then one thing that we can do to abstract stable, stable curves is we can forget some of the red ends. I can forget this end, and now I have a tr uh, tropical, abstract tropical curve with only three ends. And notice that because now this vertex is only two valent, now we demote it, we make it not be a vertex anymore, and so we lose this compact edge. Where before we had an edge, now we only have one end. This is called stabilization, okay? All right, that was maybe a little bit quick, but the idea is that this moduli spaces that are all pretty similar to moduli spaces of tropical abstract rational curves, they communicate with each other in ways that are rather natural and in the next 15, 20 minutes, we're gonna exploit this communication to solve an enumerative geometric question, okay? 
So if there is no questions, I'll there is on. a question actually. There is a question. Okay. What is the D in the in the evaluation morphism? What is the D? Well, what is uh, oh no, the source morphism. Sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you. So this, I should just have said P two D, and then this three D is the number of direction vectors um, of non-contracted ends. All right, so if you want to do the more general case with the degree as delta, then this 3D should be replaced with uh, um, the number of vectors in the collection delta. Thank you. That's a typo. I'll, I'll, I'll go over the slide and, and fix all the typos that have been pointed out. That's a, a great, great audience to have. Uh, any other question? Okay. Then let's move on to our numerative problem. Okay. So in classical algebraic geometry, a very old enumerative problem is to count the number of rational plane curves of degree d through 3d minus 1 general points of the plane. So here is my picture kind of suggestively um, depicting a degree 3 rational curve, right? So something that wants to be an elliptic curve but degenerated and acquired a node through eight points in the plane. How do you know <laughs> that the uh, image has a well-defined degree is another question. How do I know that the image has a well-defined degree? Okay. Uh, in the moduli space of tro tropical stable maps, um, the degree of the image is going to be specified by the, um, the delta, which is the direction vectors of the ends, the non-contracted ends. Because remember, the degree of a tropical curve, you know, abstractly is encoded by the ends that go to infinity. But how the tropical curve goes to infinity? Maybe go back to the next, uh, last slide, then I can ask the question. So the forgetful map is from M drop to M drop, or um, I'm not sure. I think the, the, oh. the point is whether there, there is one yeah, uh, mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Missing. There's another drop missing. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, there's okay. another drop missing here. Okay. Uh, uh, Oh, and the question from before is coming back. Um, uh, so how do you number, know that there, are, had, there is the same number of edges going to infinity in the three directions? Oh, this is part, this is part of the data, right? So if I, say, if I say I want to look at M0 n trop of P2 D, then I have defined, you know, this D to means that I have D copies of the vectors minus E1, D copies of the vectors minus E2, and D copies of the vector plus E1 plus E2. Now, of course, you might be, you know, remembering that in, you know, we saw tropical curves, right, that look like, I don't know, I should not try to do it on the fly, but, but they have edges that go infinity with multiplicity more than one, right? And so you would say, for example, actually, let me do an example that I can do on the fly, which is this is a tropical conic, right? That correspond to not subdividing the Newton polygon. And so each n gets weight two. Well, this is not going to be appearing in a modular space of stable maps, M0, P2, 2. So this is not going to belong to this. Okay. In this modular space are only welcome curves that honestly go to infinity with two ends of weight 1 in each of the directions. Any other question? 
So just from the definition of a tropical map, you get a well-defined degree. I think it's, yes. So, yeah. That, so the degree is part of the discrete data that you have to specify when you talk about a moduli space of stable maps. And if you start with just being given one map, you can look at the direction vectors of the ends that are not contracted, and that specifies the degree. Great. So our numerical now problem is- This is because of balancing, is that- This is because of balancing, yes. Yeah. Okay, so now n trop is the same enumerated problem, but in tropical algebraic geometry, right? So we're going to count the number of tropical rational plane curves of degree p, 3d minus 1 points in general position the plane, counted with a proper multiplicity. And let me jump straight to the answer, and then we'll spend the next 10 minutes discussing how to prove it, right? So here is a theorem uh, that is a collage of theorems of Konsevich, uh, Grisha Mikalkin, and uh, Gathman and Marvig. The first point is that these two enumerative problems have the same solution, nb is equal to nd trop. Both sets of numbers satisfy the same recursion. They're computed by this recursion that expresses nd trop as a sum of products of nd trops for smaller di's, um, you know, weighted by some binomial and polynomial coefficients that the first time you see them look really ugly, and then what, once you've looked at them enough are really, really like beautiful. And finally, the third part of the problem is that there are, there's an explicit combinatorial algorithm to determine combinatorial types of tropical curves in terms of what are called lattice path, lattice path counts and their multiplicity in terms of the simplicial areas of triangles of the Newton, of the subdivision of the Newton polytope, which is dual to count. Okay, so we're not gonna focus on three. Three is maybe the part which is most uh, exciting from a combinatorial perspective. But we're gonna focus, I wanna show you a sketch of the proof of number two, because it's a geometric proof that is very similar in tropical algebraic geometry and in classical algebraic geometry. So I think it's a, it's a bonus. We get to learn two things at the same time. So the first step is that we're gonna interpret ND as an intersection number or if you want, as a degree of a map of fans, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider the map of balance mark fans given by the product of the evaluation morphs, right? So I have three D minus one evaluation morphisms in M0, three D minus one trop of P2 D. Each evaluation morphism maps to R2. And so I get a map from the moduli space of tropical stable maps to R to the 6D minus two, one can check that M0 and M0 3D minus one P2D is also a fan of 6D minus two dimension. So this is a map of fans of the same dimensions, um, weighted, balanced, it has a well-defined degree. This degree is ND, because let's think a little bit about what it means to compute the degree of this map. Well, it means... Is it nd trop? It is nd trop. But which by the first part, part of the problem is equal to nd, right? So uh, it's not completely dishonest. It's nd trop, however, right? Because what does it mean to... Uh, look, compute the degree of this map, it means to fix a point in R to the 6D minus two, but this is the same as, six, as fixing 3D minus one points. On the plane. And then the way that we compute the degree is we look at the inverse images of these points of, sorry, the inverse image of this point in R6 minus two, which means at all the maps that send the first evaluation morphins to P1, the second one to P2, 
and so on and so forth, all the way to 3D mi minus one. And so these are precisely the tropical curves that we're looking for, those that go studying to see that the multiplicity of the map F is precisely the, most, the multiplicity we want to count this curve. Okay? So what we've done right now, we've, we've translated our problem to being a, a problem of computing the degree of a map of X. Okay, now this is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, what's and the so, fan structure of R to the 6D minus two? So here, for example, you can just, um, you know, subdivide every R as uh, R plus R greater than zero union R less than or equal to zero and take this, the 6D minus two. And this should, for example, work. Um, it might end up, you know, it might end up needing to be further refined because of what we said that we want to think of sending cones to cones. But um, yeah, that's that's one one option to start with. Okay. Great. So, what's the strategy of proof? The strategy of proof. Yeah, let's catch this step is to, in fact, consider an auxiliary map of fans, right? Um, so instead of 3D minus one points, instead of looking at the thing that we want to compute, we add one more mark point, right? We have 3D, so one extra point. And instead of R to the 6D minus two, we map to this product. We have this map. So what are we going to do? We're going to ev evaluate only the first coordinate of the first mark point. So this is, we're going to evaluate only the second coordinate of the second mark point. We're going to evaluate both coordinates of the remaining mark points. And then the last factor we're going to do is we're going to forget the map. We're going to forget all the markings except the first four. And then we're going to look at what element of M04 trop do we get. Okay. So if I fix a point in the target space, right, what I'm ending up fixing, I'm ending up fixing a vertical line in R2. And I want the first mark point to land on this vertical line. I'm going to fix a horizontal line, and I'm asking the second mark point to land on this horizontal line. I'm fixing a bunch of points, and I'm um, asking my curve to map the remaining mark points to this bunch of points. And then what I'm fixing is a four-pointed tropical curve. And what I'm asking is that my gamma, which is in principle a lot more complicated, is my gamma that will map in here, maps to this green curve if you forget all the other ends other than those label one, two, three, four. Okay, so if I forget everything else, and then what's remaining, let me highlight in green here, this should be equal to this mark. Okay. Okay, so why do we why do we construct this auxiliary map? Well, the reason is that we showed it has a well-defined degree. And then we compute the degree in two different ways, by looking at two different points, Q1 and Q2. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to fix, oops, raise this part. 
we're going to fix x naught, y naught, p3 to p3d to be the same in both cases. Right? So this part is same conditions. Which means that I'm fixing the same two blue lines and the same 3d minus 2 points. But what I'm changing is the point in number 0, 4. Because in one case, I'm going to have 1 and 2 being adjacent to one vertex. And in the other case, I'm going to have 1 and 3 adjacent to this vertex. And then the other thing I'm going to ask is that the length of the compact edge in M04 is very, very large. So these requirements, the fact that these are very, very large, forces, in fact, I'm going to ask it to be much larger than you know, the relative distance of the points and the lines. Right? Say, like my points and lines fit, fit within my screen, and my D is 3 miles. So you're probably, you know, this is a little computation of what you do, but it's not hard to be convinced that if my D is three miles, then my tropical curve gamma should probably have a contracting edge that is not a mark M. But it should contract a compact edge, right? Because this three miles, if they get spread in the plane, they're, you know, they're not as a compact edge, they're not going to allow me to hit all this interesting geometry that ha happens in a small region of the plane. And if my curve has an edge that contracts in the middle of it, then I can remove this edge and get a decomposition of my map gamma phi into two maps, gamma 1 phi 1 and gamma 2 phi 2 of degree d1 and d2. Okay. And so now, and I apologize going a little bit fast, but I'll be happy to stay, to get to the end, and then let people that want to run away, run away, and stay and take any questions that, uh, that will be around. Um, and now what we have to do is, for each of the points q1 and q2, we compute the multiplicity of this map pi as the determinant of the matrix that represents the function in a basis given by marking, markings. This is some big matrix that is not block decomposed, but it's almost block decomposed. One can do some row and column operations, and one can show that you can obtain a block decomposition of this matrix that gives you like the product of the matrix that complete, computes the multiplicity for the problem ND1 and the matrix that computes the multiplicity for the problem ND2 corresponding to gamma 1 and gamma 2. And then when you compare the fact that the degree is well defined and is computed as the sum of multiplicities over inverse image of Q1 being equal to the sum of inverse image over, over Q2, then you get precisely this recursion. So in the last slide here, I want to just look at one particular example. Here is an example where my long contracted edge is <clears throat> very close to the ends marked by 1 and 2. And remember, the end marked 1 should have ended up on this vertical blue line. The end marked 2 should have ended up on the horizontal blue line. But because the purple edge must be contracted, <clears throat> then 1 and 2 must be contracted at the same point. So the only place you have to go is the point of intersection of the, the two lines. And so what I have here, right, is the image is a conic that passes through five mark points. This is exactly one of the things that contributes to the problem N2. And then, so here I've computed the big matrix that computes the multiplicity of the map pi. And now notice that I have a column of zeros here. Let me pop out my thing here. So I have a column when I have all zero and just one one here. So I can really erase this line and this row. And what I'm left with is this matrix. 
And now notice that here I'm evaluating the x coordinate and the y coordinate of the first and the second mark, but the first and the second mark are, are both forced to coincide here, right? The point P. So this is really the x and y evaluation of one point, the, this point, and then I have ordinary x and y evaluation of other four points. So this is precisely the matrix, you know, computing the multiplicity for the count n2. There's a question. Yeah. Can multiple edges be contracted? So um, in principle, yes. But by genericity, one can actually show that it will only happen that exactly one compact edge will be contracted. That's, that's a very good question. But in principle, yeah, we're not, we're not vetoing that. But because we've chosen the numerics and the points in general position, it will be exact. Yeah. Um, so one of the, you know, it's a mega exercise in the exercise session tomorrow. And if somebody's already kind of familiar with these ideas, but haven't, hasn't worked through the proof of this theorem uh, on their own, uh, then you're welcome to go through the mega exercise. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, you know, uh, I hope I've at least conveyed a little bit of, you know, the strategy of proof and how this um, proof goes. I'm going to stop here. I'm just going to mention that in the slides, if you want, there's a couple more slides, one that mention, you know, where the field has gone from here. And as usual, these are like incomplete uh, slides, but they're, you know, the references that, um, you know, I know, I knew off the top of my head. And there's some papers here that you might want to read. Um, I'm going to stop here, but I'm more than happy to take uh, as many questions and stay as long as people would like to stay. Thank you very much.